ओम तवकथामृत तप्त जीवन कविपरीटित कलमशापहम श्रवणमंगल श्रीमदात भुवि वनती भूरिराजना Om, your words are like nectar, bringing life to scorched souls. They are praised by poets. They remove all sin. They are auspicious to hear. They are wonderful and exalted. Those who spread these words are the greatest benefactors in the world. Welcome, everyone, to our class on the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Those who are following along in the book, we are on page. 91 and this is the chapter the master and disciple and this is uh, one of the early visits of course maybe third visit of uh, of m to sri ramakrishna and on that particular day there was a young man in the room by the name of narendra and this is uh, possibly the first time it is a little surprising since uh, Narendra uh, was a regular visitor to the Brahmo Samaj and M was also very close uh, that they didn't know each other maybe they'd seen each other before uh, and of course M was a little bit older but anyhow this is the first time that they're really uh, being introduced to each other and getting to know each other uh, last time uh, there were several the conversations with regard to Narendra and how he should behave in the world uh and Sri Ramakrishna had asked him to come again so we'll begin at the bottom of page 91 Narendra a member of the Brahmo Samaj was very particular about his promises he said with a smile yes sir i shall try now, i mentioned the Brahmo Samaj before the the movement itself is not terribly important uh today but uh considering the the number of people uh direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna that came through the Brahmo Samaj and the uh, householder disciples uh and the close relationship between Keshav Chandra Sen and Sri Ramakrishna the role of the Brahmo Samaj uh in the Ramakrishna movement is very important and this uh, Keshav was really the first one to let the people of Calcutta no about Sri Ramakrishna because he was so impressed with him and really so free from from jealousy it was really remarkable that uh, he would send people to him and they wrote wrote about him in in their uh uh what is it called sulab uh, uh samacha and their their uh, magazine that they that they published uh had wrote a, a small a life a sketch of Sri Ramakrishna so many came through at Keshab uh how narendra came uh we we have different uh, uh scenarios you can say one is very well known that uh, one day in at his university his regular professor wasn't there so the principal of the school professor hair he came and the uh, topic was about uh, wordsworth and these poets who would go into ecstasy uh is looking at nature and uh, the story goes that he mentioned if you want to see someone who has these exalted states of consciousness then you can go to dakshineshwar and see sri ramakrishna so this is one scenario that we have uh the other we know that uh the other beloved householder disciple uh, sarendra was having a meeting at his house and uh, narendra who lived nearby was called there in order to sing and he met sri ramakrishna the first time it wasn't uh, a very dramatic meeting like the meeting in dakshineshwar but he met him then and sri ramakrishna uh, asked him to come and see him sometime at, at dakshineshwar so it could be uh through his professor it could be through that meeting it could be through his contact with the brahmo samaj but in any event uh, he started coming uh the year prior to m so he's already quite well known to sri ramakrishna and uh, we know of all the uh experiences that he had uh, at the touch of sri ramakrishna and, and all of that so he's asking him uh, to start coming more often Narendra a member of the Brahmo Samaj was very particular about his promises he said with a smile yes sir i shall try 
Now, not only particular with his promises, but uh, joining the Brahma Samaj meant really taking a vow. Really, they even signed papers, I think, that they won't do certain things. They won't engage in any uh, image worship, go into a temple of Baal before an image. It was considered a type of an idolatry uh, because the Brahma Samaj was very much influenced by Western ideas. And uh, uh, they didn't have much of a belief in this guru system uh, or the avatar or even, even some of the ideas of Advaita Vedanta. The main way that God was worshipped was as the uh, formless Brahmin uh, with certain types of attributes, almost like the Western style that we see in uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And uh, based mostly on the Upanishads, really the founder or the initial inspiration was uh, Raja Ram Mohan Roy. And then after that, uh, Rabindranath Tagore's father, Devendranath, and then it came down to that way. And Keshav became the leader during Thakur's time, and then it split. And we see Vijay Krishna Goswami, who was the right-hand man of Keshav, he joins the other group. It gets a little, a little complicated, but uh, in any event, we owe them a great debt of, of gratitude because they were very instrumental in uh, making Thakur known because he had no interest in uh, publicizing himself even though he had a great interest in his uh, intimate uh, devotees coming to him. So much so that uh, during a certain period of his life, after he had finished all of his sadhana, uh, he told others, Mathur Babu and others, that the Divine Mother said that my, my real devotees are yet to come. Because the, the Brahmo members came, and he was very fond of them. But he wanted someone, those to come, who would accept his ideal of uh, f complete renunciation for the, uh, for the sake of God realization. So he was uh, waiting for, for them, really his direct monastic disciples, to come. So he would question himself, Mother told me this, how is it not true? And every night he would go up to the roof. There's a, a building just to the north of Sri Ramakrishna's room on the other side where Mathur Babu stayed. Actually, Sri Ramakrishna stayed there his first, I think, 16 years. He didn't move to his present room, the one that we know of, until after his nephew Akshay died in, in the other room and, and he didn't want to stay there anymore. So he would go to the roof and cry, uh, where are you? Please come. I've been waiting for you. And then after that, one by one, they started to come. Uh, two of the, the two most important, of course, that Ender and Rakal have already come. And they were both friends because they knew each other from the Brahma Samaj and also a school. They used to go to the same gym, gymnasium. In those days, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on, on sports and wrestling and exercise and things like that. So they, they knew each other there. We'll see Rakal also today. So he said with a smile, yes, sir, I shall try. As they were returning to the master's room, Sri Ramakrishna said to M, when peasants go to market to buy bullocks for their plows, they can easily tell the good from the bad by touching their tails. On being touched there, some meekly lie down on the ground. The peasants recognize that these are without metal and so reject them. They select only those bullocks that frisk about and show spirit when their tails are touched. Narendra is like a bullock of this latter class. He is full of spirit within. The master smiled as he said this and continued, There are some people who have no grit whatever. They are like flattened rice soaked in milk, soft and mushy, no inner strength. This was one of the uh, favorite expressions of, of Sri Ramakrishna. He used to say, Kubrok chai. That means that we have to have tremendous grit, tremendous determination. And uh, Swamiji, uh, he used to say that uh, if somebody says that uh, you have to empty the ocean with a blade of grass, you go and, and you put a grid, one drop at a time. And if you have that type of perseverance, that you won't give up, you can, and then you can, you can realize God. So Sri Ramakrishna, he said, that because it's tough, it's not easy, 
we think we're making some progress and then we get disappointed and we fall back and we lose our enthusiasm. So uh, we have to have this tremendous grit. Uh, Swamiji had a couple of uh, other nice uh, expressions when people would say, why do you keep uh, leading this type of life if you're, if you're not experiencing the highest uh, realization and everything? So he said, uh, just because I can't get a Ganges water to drink, should I drink dirty ditch water? Huh? So, and then, uh, what was the other one? But Ram and Shyam. Huh? If, <laughs> if I can't find my friend Ram, shall I just go to the other friend Shyam? Something like that. Anyhow, the point, point is that uh, we, we have to have tremendous determination. Takwa gives another example. If somebody takes up something just as a hobby, Somebody is a, a, a city boy, but he thinks, oh, let me try to, to take up farming, have a garden and everything. And uh, the first year, he doesn't get any crop at all. He works very hard. And then he says, okay, I gave it a try, and then gives it up. But if someone is a farmer, and they don't know anything with farming, and their ancestors have done it year after year after year, whether they have a good crop or a bad crop, they'll continue, because they're farmers. This is what they do, and this is, this is, this is their life. So in spiritual life, we have to have that feeling also, whether we succeed or fail, this is, this is what we do. This is who we are. This is what our life is all about. We have to have this tremendous grit determination. So that means that uh, at the slightest obstacle, we don't simply give up. We have to continue. It was dusk. The master was meditating on God. He said to M, go and talk to Narendra, then tell me what you think of him. Now, Thakur, usually he would say, what do you think of me? But this is, this is his way, uh, not of judging Narendra. It's not that if M comes back and says, oh, he's an ordinary person, that Thakur will say, oh, okay, I thought he was something special, but he's just ordinary. He's testing M because he knows that Narendra is something very, very special. And he wants to see if M has that enough of an insight to also recognize this greatness of Narendra. This is number one. Number two, Thakur liked to uh, see his devotees form a certain type of relationship and friendship. He wanted them all to feel like they're one family, but he also uh, would pair them off together. He would say, I I'm like the, uh, the housewife who knows what pot goes with, uh, what lid goes with what pot. We have a whole bunch of pots and lids and they're all scattered about and we keep trying to see which one fits. We have that with the Tupperware. We, <laughs> we have dozens and dozens of, of things that, that people have brought food for us, and they're, they're all in our pantry, and half the time the tops don't fit the bottoms, and we have to figure out what goes with what. So Takur would say the expert housewife, she knows automatically what goes with what. That man, that Takur knew that which devotees personality-wise uh, made a good pair and could help each other in spiritual life, either because they were the same wavelength or they complemented each other and, and fulfilled a lack in the other, but he knew that. So we'll see with, uh, later with Bhavanath. Bhavanath and, and Narendra, uh, he was happy to see them come together. But he also uh, wanted to see M and Narendra uh, develop a friendship. And I mentioned last time they developed a very, very close friendship. Uh, uh, even to the point where uh, M used to give money to uh, Narendra's mother after they were in, in such a dire straits without saying anything to anybody. So they, they had a very nice relationship. Despite the fact that M was also a little bit slow uh, to accept some of Swamiji's ideas when he came back from the West, uh, two things in particular. Uh, one was to start, he wanted the monks to start preaching, and the second was he wanted them to start doing social service work. And M uh, always remembered the Sri Ramakrishna telling them that uh, you need this badge of authority before you can preach, otherwise it won't make any difference to people, no one will listen to you. And also saying that first realize God and then uh, live in the world and do other things. But uh, and, and N wasn't the only one. 
Swami Yogananda, Swami Premada, many of them. But they all came around and understood that not only was this really brilliant on Swamiji's part, but it was very consistent with the teachings of Sri Ramakrishna. And the wonderful thing is that the one person who had no doubt that this was Thakur's work, this, so all of these things, was Holy Mother. She was the one who had that, that insight more than the, even the, the other direct disciples did. But eventually they all came to, to a, a, appreciate, of course, uh, Swamiji's uh, ideas. And they all knew that uh, Swamiji was carrying the torch. Sri Ramakrishna had told all of them that uh, he'll be your leader, you can follow him, that he's doing my bidding. So they all knew that even though they didn't quite understand all the time. So he wants the two of them to meet together. Evening worship was over in the temples. M met Narendra on the bank of the Ganges, and they began to converse. Narendra told M about his study in college, his being a member of the Brahma Samaj, and so on. It was now late in the evening, and time for M's departure, but he felt reluctant to go, and instead went in search of Sri Ramakrishna. He had been fascinated by the master singing and wanted to hear more. At last he found the master pacing alone in the Nat Mandir in front of the Kali temple. If you go to Dakshineshwar, you'll see this big uh, uh, covered area, but uh, open on, on the side, some pillars holding it up. They used to have jatras plays and, and musical performances and things. The idea was that if you have some dance performance or something like that, uh, this is visible from the Kali temple. Mother Kali can see it. This is also a type of, of, uh, of, of worship, uh, pre presenting some enjoyment for the, the Divine Mother to watch, and of course for the devotees as well. So Thakur and, and others would sometimes sit there also, sit there quietly, you could sit there and meditate. And from there, looking upward, you can see the image of Mother Kali. A lamp was burning in the temple on either side of the image of the Divine Mother. The single lamp and the spacious Nat Mandir blended light and darkness into a kind of mystic twilight in which the figure of the Master could be dimly seen. M had been enchanted by the Master's sweet music. With some hesitation, he asked him whether there would be any more singing that evening. No, not tonight, said Sri Ramakrishna after a little reflection. Now, we already know from the earlier visit that uh, whenever uh, it became uh, dusk, whenever the sun would set, this Shonda uh, Balai, uh, they say, that uh, Sri Ramakrishna would go into a, a very deep mood. He would, uh, this divine intoxication would automatically come upon him. He didn't try or think about it or anything, but uh, it would just automatically come, this, this change from day into night, that his mind would go in, into some high spiritual mood. So he was in that type of mood. So he said, after a little reflection, uh, as if remembering something, he said, but I'm going soon to Balaram Bose's house in Calcutta. Come there and you'll hear me sing and agreed to go. Now this Balaram Bosch, he also plays a very, very important role in this, this Ramakrishna Leela. Sri Ramakrishna, it's, it's said, went to his house, stayed there a hundred times on a hundred different occasions, more than any other place in Calcutta. And uh, he loved his Balaram Bosch. Balaram Bosch was I belong to uh, a, a very orthodox Vaishnava family. In fact, most of the members were so orthodox that uh, they really were not very happy that he was visiting Sri Ramakrishna, who didn't belong to their community. Their community was a very tight, uh, in, ingrown type of, of community. Uh, even though Sri Ramakrishna had tremendous love for Chaitanya Deva and, and uh, this, uh, Krishna Leela and everything else, uh, they didn't have that same liberal uh, attitude that Sri Ramakrishna had, of course. And Balaram Bose was different. Uh, and extremely humble and extremely simple and uh, very generous. His house in Calcutta became almost like a second monastery because many of the, the monks would stay there. 
uh, Swami Turiyananda stayed there. Uh, Swami Brahmananda stayed there. Latu Maharaj stayed there. Uh, Koko Maharaj, many of them. Uh, Raja Maharaj, Swami Brahmananda, was always hesitant to stay in Balarmad during the rainy season because of malaria. So very often he would stay there with them. So the house was open. It was like their own house. They were, and Balaram and his, his wife also, who was, was very highly devoted, uh, they, they well, just kept it as a, a place where any of the direct disciples could stay. And uh, they also had a relationship to a marriage with uh, Babu Ramaraj, with Swami Premananda's family. So it was a little bit tight-knit. There were different relationships. Uh, uh, Swami Ramananda was also, uh, through marriage, related to Manamohan Mitra, one of them. Anyhow, so the, <laughs> they, they all kind of got related a little bit. Uh, Ram Chandra Datta and Swamiji also were related, a little bit distant, I think, but uh, they were also related to each other. Master, do you know Balaram Bosch? See, M had agreed without really knowing who he was. In those days, uh, of course, there were many people living in Calcutta, but it's not like today. And if there was a certain area and there were people who were well known, you could probably find out. People would know where they lived. So it wasn't so unusual that he agreed to go without really knowing him. Uh, so M says, no, sir, I don't. Master, he lives in Boshpara. Well, sir, I shall find him. As Sri Ramakrishna walked up and down the hall with M, he said to him, let me ask you something. What do you think of me? So earlier he wants to see what do you think of Narendra. Now, uh, Thakur uh, did not lack in self-confidence. He didn't need people to flatter him. In fact, he, he, he would make fun of flatterers very often. The Jadu Malik used to keep these flatterers around him. And he would say, why do you keep these, these clowns <laughs> and flatterers with you all of the time? So Jadu said, so that you can save them. <laughs> Funny incident. But anyhow, uh, this was his way of, of judging because uh, there's a saying that only a God realized realize soul can recognize a God realized soul. Now, he's not trying to see is, is M a God realized soul, but if he has uh, any type of, of spiritual sensitivity, he'll recognize the greatness of Sri Ramakrishna. And if he belongs to that place, Sri Ramakrishna used to use that, that expression. That meant that someone was his very own. There's Ekan Kalok. He belongs to this place. That means this, this, they have this, this relationship not simply from this lifetime. And Thakur used to, in, in his mystic vision, he used to uh, see uh, what connection these, all of these disciples had uh, in a previous lifetime or uh, what he used to say, what gore. He used to use this term room that uh, wh where they belonged, someone belonged to, this, to the, uh, the area of Radha, for example, or Krishna or Arjuna, something like that. Not that they were necessarily uh, the incarnation or anything, but uh, they, they came from that. That was their, 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 their nature somehow. M uh, and Balaram Bose, both of them, he had a vision once with Chaitanya Deva was doing kirtan and there were all these people there and he said, I saw Balaram Bose was one of the followers of Chaitanya Deva and he said, I believe that I saw him there also. It was very curious, without, without tremendous conviction, but I believe that I saw him there also. So uh, the, the Balaram Bose uh, uh, was a great, one of the great householder uh, disciples of Sri Ramakrishna and uh, uh, was a, a very uh, soft-spoken, very humble type of person, very sweet-natured. Um, well, sir, I shall find him. As Sri Ramakrishna walked up and down the hall with them, he said to him, let, oh, sorry, let me ask you something, what do you think of me? Em remained silent. Again, Sri Ramakrishna asked, what do you think of me? How many anas of knowledge of God have I? Um, I don't understand what you mean by anas, but of this I am sure. I've never before seen such knowledge, ecstatic love, faith in God, renunciation, and Catholicity anywhere. The Master left. Now the anas, of course, this uh, 
Uh, the, old, the old way of counting paisa in India, that uh, char ana, four anas is 25 paisa. Huh? So 16 anas will make one rupee. So if you say eight anas, that means 50%. 12 anas, 75%. Like that. Now I'll tell you an interesting story. <laughs> uh, this uh, was a conversation that I had once with Swami Bhudeshanandiji Maharaj. Swami Bhudeshanandiji, he was president at that time, and uh, he is the one who gave me initiation into brahmacharya and into sannyasin, both. Now, uh, whenever we went to Belarmad, it's still the custom that all of the monks will, will go Generally, every morning, unless there's uh, some special occasion or he's giving initiation, we'll go every morning, just the monks will go, and they'll make pranam and, uh, and then leave. Now, during Swami Bhuteshananji's time, he didn't like the monks to make pranam and leave. He liked them to stay and ask questions. And it was a tremendous experience because uh, his, his sense of humor and his, his simplicity, this very naive sense of humor, it was so sweet. And uh, his answers to questions were so insightful that uh, the monks, myself included, uh, looked forward to it every day. We couldn't wait to go. And it would take about 15 minutes. And it was just it's so enjoyable and wonderful. That, uh, uh, to, to, and, and most of these things, have, or many have been recorded. There's something called uh, Pari Prashna, and these, these are recorded conversations that took place mostly during those periods. The monks would ask questions and he would give answers, uh, but a very sweet and simple. Half the time we would be laughing at, uh, at him because of his simplicity, not that he was telling jokes all of the time. But uh, generally, if, if we were coming from outside of Belarmat, the first day perhaps we would go and, and uh, not being back with everybody else, to go in front and, and make pranam, or the day that we left. So this was the day I was, I was leaving, so they let me go and, and actually make, otherwise we're at a slight distance, make pranam and touch his feet, and I sat there and everything, and he was speaking, he spoke in Bengali all of the time, even though he could speak beautiful English, he gave beautiful lectures in English also, but everyone there uh, more or less understood Bengali. So uh, he, he looked at me and he said, oh, but he won't understand. Now, I knew some Bengali, of course. So the other monk said, no, no, he knows Bengali, he knows Bengali. So he looked at me and he said, how much Bengali do you know? So I said, uh, we do atana. <laughs> that means 50% of that I could follow of what he said, because uh, he spoke quickly, his, uh, he was elderly, uh, his, his uh, uh, speech wasn't so clear and everything. So he laughed so much and he looked at me and he said, Baba, we don't have Anas anymore in India. <laughs> so this was the old style. I, of course, didn't know if the people still use that uh, anymore to say 50%. But anyhow, it's a very sweet memory of mine. Whenever I, I read this about this, uh, how many Anas of knowledge do I have, I remember that incident. Okay. So M also says, I don't know what you mean by anas, but of this I am sure. I've never before seen such knowledge, ecstatic love, faith in God, renunciation, and Catholicity anywhere. Now the M was also not one to flatter anyone, not one to exaggerate. When M says this, he means it. He may be even understating it. Uh, because when he saw Sri Ramakrishna, he felt that Shukadeva himself or Chaitanya Deva himself were, were there present before him. He was, was the, that impressed at the very first meeting. The master laughed and bowed low before him and took his leave. He had gone as far as the main gate of the temple garden when he suddenly remembered something and came back to Sri Ramakrishna, who was still in the Nat Mandir. Now, we'll get my favorite image in the entire Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. This is, this is something that uh, I have pictured so many times. In the dim light, remember that uh, uh, the sun has set and there are a couple of, of lamps burning in the Natmandir and, and the light in the temple, so it's, it's quite dark. In the dim light, the master, all alone, was pacing the hall, rejoicing in the self, Atmarama. This is Atmarama state, rejoicing in the self, as the lion lives and roams alone in the forest. The Pashupati, the lord of, of the jungle, uh, 
this, this image to me uh, is so sweet because uh, we, we get this, this picture of Sri Ramakrishna in a state of such a joy, not in the temple, not seeing the image of the Divine Mother, but just the joy welling up within, so much so that he can't uh, even sit still, pacing back and forth, walking back and forth. If you've seen a, a, a lion, of course not in the jungle, we see him in the zoo, but even then, pacing back and forth, to, with the tremendous strength and power within, knowing that nothing can touch it, fearless. Uh, but also this, this idea that there's, everything is, is within, that joy is within. So this is that Atmarama state, and uh, if we want to have some, some idea of what it's like, we can picture Sri Ramakrishna pacing back and forth, hardly aware, aware of where he is, completely indrawn, uh, just filled with the bliss of the self, Atmarama state. In silent wonder, M surveyed that great soul, master to M. So he wasn't, he wasn't lost in ecstasy. He was aware of what was taking place, but the mind was at a higher level, but he saw M. What makes you come back, M? Perhaps the house you asked me to go to belongs to a rich man. They may not let me in. I think I'd better not go. I would rather meet you here. See, he had promised. He had said, I will go. He didn't want to not go without telling him. So to give him a reason for that. Master, oh no. Why should you think that? Now, he says a very simple thing. Just mention my name. Amar Nam Koro. Just mention my name. Say that you want to see me, then someone will take you to me. Years later, M would look back, and uh, there's a very simple statement. Repeating the name of Sri Ramakrishna, Shorabana Mangalam, huh? this repeating the name of Sri Ramakrishna uh, is in itself uh, a very sacred thing. And uh, uh, even during Holy Mother's time, she started giving his name as, uh, for initiation. So Sri Ramakrishna felt that, I don't know if he really felt that though now I've been initiated, I should repeat his name. Nothing like that exactly, but he took this as something very significant. Just as when Thakur said, uh, Abharesho, come again, he took that as something very significant. That, oh, this, this God-realized soul, he wants me to come again. So he said, yes, I'll come again. Normally, we, it's like, you know, see you later and say, okay, see you later. We don't pay too much attention to it. Everybody says it. It doesn't mean much. But M, uh, whatever Sri Ramakrishna said, really, this was Tavagatamritam. These were, these were blissful words. These were, uh, these were the gospel to him. So he took that as something very, very uh, significant. I mentioned, I think, in the first talk that uh, M made a list of, uh, uh, not only did he record all of the words, he made a list of things which he called the upadeshas, direct instruction. Whenever Sri Ramakrishna said something to him that was a direct instruction, he kept that separate. And when he made a great statement, he kept that separate, uh, keeping a list of the equivalent to Upanishadic Mahavakyas. So uh, the words of Sri Ramakrishna for M were holy as the Vedas. They, uh, they carry tremendous weight. So even just saying, take my name. That means when you go there, uh, just say that Thakur told me to come, that you'll be very much welcome there. M nodded his assent, and after saluting the master, took his leave. This is the end of that chapter, and uh, now we'll find that uh, M does go to Balaram Bose's house, and uh, this will be the, uh, the next meeting. Now, uh, we have the first time that M gives dates. This is March 11th, 1882. If we remember the last time, I think he just gave the month. Huh? Anyhow. So March 11th, 1882. About eight o'clock in the morning, Sri Ramakrishna went as planned to Balaram Bose's house in Calcutta. Okay, so he wasn't going that same day. He said, I'm going soon to Balaram Bose's house. Okay. Uh, it was the day of the Doljatra. M. Monomohan Rakal 
who became Swami Brahmananda, of course, Nitya Gopal and other devotees were with him. M2 came as bidden by the master. Now, he'll get to meet, uh, little by little, some of the very important uh, disciples and devotees of Sri Ramakrishna. Here we have Ram. Ram Chandradatta, I mentioned, was uh, a relative of, of Swamiji. Uh, Sri Ramakrishna went to his house often, and uh, he had a garden house built. This was common for well-to-do people in Calcutta that they live in the city, but in the suburbs, a little bit uh, away from the crowded area, they'll have a garden house where they can go and spend some time. It'll be a quiet place. They can uh, have the shrine there and do their meditation and everything. Uh, that house that he had built, that garden house, in a place called Kankurgachi, is now one of the main centers of our order, Jogodan, it's called. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna went there uh, many times, and uh, after his passing away, when there was no place for the young boys to stay, there was no monastery at that time, and uh, there was really no place to install the ash ashes of Sri Ramakrishna, the relics, after their cremation, that uh, Ram said, uh, we'll keep it here, we'll, we'll have a special place made for it, and uh, it'll be a sacred place, everybody can come, and uh, we can have a, a worship here and uh, all of that. So it was agreed to, but Swamiji Narendra and some of the others knew that Sri Ramakrishna, and Sri Ramakrishna said to Swamiji, that wherever you carry me on your shoulder there, I'll stay. Now, they took this as meaning that uh, the relics, this wasn't the only meaning, of course, but w w one way that they understood it was that uh, he will dwell in a special sense, manifest in a special sense where uh, the, the ashes and bone, the relics, uh, will be kept. So these young boys felt that uh, uh, if, if the ashes are kept in Ram's place and they'll be put in a casket, it'll be interred in the ground, it'll be impossible to get them up, they what to do. So secretly, they took a good portion, probably a better portion, of, uh, of the, the relics, the ash and, and bone, whatever was left, and they kept it separately. Now, we sometimes think that there was a little bit of a split between the monastic disciples and the householder disciples, but actually, uh, M knew about it, and Balaram Bose also. And if, if memory serves me correctly, I think that this portion that they kept, they kept in Balaram Bose's house at that time. Huh? Uh, eventually, of course, when the Balaramad was started, or Baranagar Mud was started first, then they took those ashes and they had them in a mm -hmm. container, which they also called Atmaram. And uh, this was the way that Thakur was worshipped mainly in the, the early days. There was no image or anything. Uh, there were photographs of him, of course, but uh, this was the main thing. And whenever there was an initiation or something, they would always come and worship the relics. Now, these relics, the ones that were kept in, in the Kankur Gachi and, and Ram Chandra Dutta's house, they're still there, of course. And the others are underneath. There's a, there's a kind of a open underneath the area, beneath the floor, the main temple of Belarmat. And this is where uh, the other ashes are, are kept. So that's Ram. Then Manomohan Mitra, he was the uh, great householder devotee who was father-in-law of Rakal. Huh? And this is another interesting thing, that uh, Rakal's marriage, we may say that, uh, what was, the, what was the, the point of all that? He's going to be, become a monk. It was through his wife's family that he came to Sri Ramakrishna. So there was some instrumentality there. Any others in Manamohan? Rakal, of course. And probably they came together, uh, the, the son-in-law and the father-in-law. Nitya Gopal, he is a very curious uh, uh, character in this divine play. Sri Ramakrishna had a very high opinion of him because he used to go into ecstatic moods. He was also quite young. He was probably uh, around 20 or something, more or less the same age as the other direct disciples. Uh, and Thakur sometimes would say that he's in the state of the Paramahamsa, 
because he would go into ecstasy and this and that. But he never became, uh, uh, we can say, the antaranga, the part of the, the inner circle, the way the others did. And uh, this inner circle, outer circle business, this, this kind of got uh, fixed a little bit when Thakur had his final illness in Kashipur. And uh, at that time, we can hear the direct disciples talking about this Niti Gopal, how uh, he also uh, didn't really uh, become one of the inner circle at that time. The other curious thing is Bhavanath. Bhavanath, who was great friends with Narendra, and Thakur loved him dearly, and Thakur also uh, looked upon him as a Nitya Siddha, sometimes even included him as an Ishwara Koti. He also drifts away a little bit at the end. So there are always some curiosities and uh, things that are a little hard to understand in this divine play. Like Judas uh, in the play of, of Christ, uh, why he turns against them and turns them in and everything. So this is uh, Nitya Gopal. Now I, I hear, and uh, somebody showed me, that there's even uh, a, a movement in a temple that now he's considered by some to be a, a, an avatar. So I... Uh, I don't know much about his later life, but he did, he was looked upon as, as, a, as, a, as a guru and a spiritual leader in God realized soul and, and had a, a, a small following like that. So, M2 came as bidden by the master. The devotees and the master sang and danced in a state of divine fervor. Several of them were in an ecstatic mood. Now we'll see this Nitya Gopal. This ecstatic mood, of course, when one goes in and, and Takwa is there, a little bit easier. <laughs> they all get lifted up, uh, as it were. So uh, uh, it may seem strange. How is it possible in one place that uh, these people are having the ecstasy and everything? But uh, this, this uh, is a little bit contagious. Several of them were in an ecstatic mood. Nitya Gopal's chest glowed with the upsurge of emotion, and Raka lay on the floor in ecstasy, completely unconscious of the world. The master put his hand on Raka's chest and said, Peace, be quiet. This was Raka's first experience of ecstasy. It's also interesting in the Dakshineshwar, when Raka had his first experience of ecstasy there, Thakur always remembered where he, he, he was standing or sitting, and he would point to that spot. This is where Rakhal had his ecstasy here. He lived with his father in Calcutta, and now and then visited the master at Dakshineshwar. About this time, he had studied a short while at Vidyasagar school at Shyampakur. When the music was over, the devotees sat down for their meal. Balaram stood there humbly like a servant. Nobody would have taken him for the master of the house. M was still a stranger to the devotees, having met only Narendra at Dakshineshwar. A few days later, now, and even now we don't have the exact date for this one. A few days later, M visited the master at Dakshineshwar. It was between four and five in the afternoon. The master and he were sitting on the steps of the Shiva temples. If you go to Dakshineshwar, uh, you'll see just south of Thakur's room, uh, there are uh, a line of temples that, uh, there are a line of uh, there 10, 12, 12, a line of six, and then that opening to go into the compound, and, and the south of that, another line of six. So, and, and this is where the steps are to go down to the main area where the other temples are. Takwa very often would sit on those steps. So the master and he were sitting on the steps of the Shiva temples, looking at the temple of Ratakanta. So that means that his back is to the, the Ganga, and he's facing east. He can see the temple of Radhakanta, and behind that you can see the spires, the top of the, of the Kali temple. Looking at the temple of Radhakanta, across the corridor, the master went into an ecstatic mood. Since his nephew Hridoy's dismissal from the temple, Sri Ramakrishna had been living without an attendant. On account of his frequent spiritual moods, he could hardly take care of himself. The lack of an attendant caused him great inconvenience. Now, Hridoy's dismissal from the temple. This is also uh, an interesting story. 
Hui Doi, we've met him already. He uh, was Taku's nephew, but they were more or less the same age. He wasn't uh, a very deep thinker. He was more an active type. He wasn't very bright, to, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. And uh, Takuro himself would say that. Uh, spiritually, uh, he had respect for Sri Ramakrishna and, and everything up to a point, uh, but wasn't really a fit candidate. He w didn't belong to the class of the other uh, disciples, of course. Once he wanted some type of ecstasy, and he asked Sri Ramakrishna, and very reluctantly, Sri Ramakrishna uh, granted him some type of experience, and afterwards he said, uh, this is not for me, this is too much. And you know, his later life was a, a little bit sad also, but what happened here, at one time he had a great desire uh, to worship the Divine Mother. And as part of that worship, a uh, part of that is, was what's called Kumari Puja, uh, seeing the Divine Mother and a young girl and worshiping her as the manifestation of the Divine Mother. Now, Hridoy got it into his head that he would worship the young daughter of Tarailokyanat, who was uh, another son-in-law of the Rani, Rani Rashmani. And uh, they, their family was very highly respected because uh, she was, was such a, a powerful woman and, and did such a tremendous uh, feed with this, this Kali temple and served so many people, but at the same time, uh, they did not belong to a high caste, this Kaiborte caste, the fisherman caste. So uh, for him to, of course being a Brahmin, for him to worship the feet, to worship this little girl who belonged to a much lower uh, caste was considered something very inauspicious and they were very nervous that something bad will happen and very annoyed. And uh, because of that, uh, they uh, decided that the Hridoy would have to leave. Now, if I, if I have my stories correct, remember, I'm, I'm getting to be a, an old man now, and, I, and my memory is not so good. But if memory serves me correctly, this was the incident where uh, somebody was told, you tell this Hridoy he has to leave the temple precinct, he's not welcome to stay here anymore that this person uh, didn't know who Hridoy was, and he mistook Sri Ramakrishna for Hridoy, and he told Sri Ramakrishna that the authorities have decided that you have to leave the temple, that you can't stay here anymore. So Sri Ramakrishna, uh, without uh, any signs of anger or questioning anything, they say he took his gamcha, threw it over his shoulder, and started walking. Maybe. Where would he go? Who knew? But he had such a dependence on the Divine Mother and was so free from care and worry about uh, what will happen that he'll always be taken care of that with, without thinking or anything, he just started walking. When word got back to the, the temple authorities what had happened, they, of course, they ran as fast as they could. They fell at his feet and said, no, no, it was, it was, it was a mistake. It's not you. Rido, please come back. So he said, okay. And he came back as if nothing had happened. So uh, it's a very interesting story. But this was the beginning of a very sad period that Rido, he left and uh, went back to his village and, and was not very successful in making a living. And uh, there's a very touching scene when he comes later to see Sri Ramakrishna. And Thakur leaves the, the, his room and goes and meets him on the footpath. Em is also there. And Rido falls at his feet. Thakur says, how are you doing? And he said, no, I'm not doing well. And he said, what's wrong? And he said, I've lost your company. He doesn't talk about there's, there's no crop and we're not making money or anything. The first thing he says is because I've lost your company. And Thakur, so sweet to him, even though uh, Ridoy, uh later in his stay with Sri Ramakrishna as his attendant, uh, became very proud of being his attendant and became uh, really very bossy and uh, uh, would actually almost torture Sri Ramakrishna. There is uh, so many incidents, things that he did. When Thakur, he had a very weak stomach, he would get sick. Sri Ramakrishna would say, look at me, I can eat anything. And uh, Sri Ramakrishna at one time said he was tortured so much by Sri Ramakrishna, he was about to drown himself in the, in the Ganges. And one incident, which is very hard to understand, 
the Holy Mother came one time, and Hridoy was so insulting to her that she and her father, that they turned around and left, and Takwa was there. And we, everyone wonders, how could he allow that to happen? But the, the, the real fact is that uh, he, he was so intimidated by the Hridoy that uh, uh, it was really necessary for the Divine Mother to uh, create some type of circumstance where he would have to leave. So uh, it was good in that sense that, that he left, but Sri Ramakrishna now has no attendant. So this is, becomes a, a big problem. Uh, some of you may have heard, I spoke last night, no, Wednesday night. Yeah, I told uh, the story about Swami Premanand, it's Baburam Maharaj. Baburam Maharaj uh, was one of the, the young boys who came to Sri Ramakrishna, who also uh, became one of the attendants. Now, there were many others. Latu Maharaj was there. Uh, Rakal stayed very often. There were others who stayed there. But when Sri Ramakrishna would go into Samadhi, his body was so sensitive that the touch of anyone uh, who uh, wasn't 100% pure in heart and pure in mind and, and simple, uh, that uh, he, he could feel something, some disturbance. If someone was really uh, of a very b bad character, it would f feel like he was stung by a, uh, a blowfish, something like that. But he used to say this, Baburam is pure to his very bones. And he always wanted him to stay. So he was very happy when Baburam Maharaj stayed because he was the one when Taka would go into Samadhi that could hold him up. Earlier we see Hridoy doing it and everything. But then Thakur, he became even more sensi sensitive to these things. So uh, this Fridoy left, and uh, there was no one to look after him at that time. Uh, Rakal will start coming and staying more often. As I say, the others will also start coming. Sri Ramakrishna was talking to Kali, the Divine Mother of the Universe. So think of this. They're sitting on the steps together. He's looking at the temple. He's going into some ecstatic mood, and he's talking to the Divine Mother. He said, Mother, everyone says, my watch alone is right. The Christians, the Brahmos, the Hindus, the Muslims all say my religion alone is true. But Mother, the fact is that nobody's watch is right. Who can truly understand thee? But if a man prays to thee with a yearning heart, he can reach thee through thy grace by any path. Now, of course, uh, everything has, has layers of meaning. This is also for M's sake, all of this. Not that, that, that Takwa is, is pretending or faking or, or creating this, but this is also for M's... Uh, not that M wasn't liberal. He was also very liberal in his thinking, but anyhow. Uh, half the time we find Takwa talking aloud to the Divine Mother is to teach others, especially with his prayer. So many times that he'll pray to the Divine Mother that I pray only for pure love and pure devotion and everything. This is for the benefit of everything and for us. Mother, show me sometime how the Christians pray to thee in their churches. But mother, what will people say if I go in? Suppose they make a fuss. Suppose they don't allow me to enter the Kali temple again. Well then, show me the Christian worship from the door of the church. Now we'll get us another visit, and, and again, we don't have a date. Now, before this, was March 11th. The next date will be April 12th. But he says, another day. The master was seated on the small couch. So, that so far, we've had like five visits, something like that. Four or five visits without exact dates yet. The master was seated on the small couch in his room. There was a one little larger bed as we enter in his room uh, on the western side of the room, and then a smaller one right next to it where Takur used to sit. He slept on the other one, and he used to sit and converse with the devotees on the small one. Just a, a wooden, wooden bed. They call it a couch. Small couch in his room with his usual beaming countenance. And arrived with Kali Krishna, this is Kali Krishna is not uh, later our Swami Virajanandaji. Kali Krishna, that Kali Krishna uh, was a, a, a young student of M's. And Kali Krishna, and uh, there were three or four of them who were all students of M's who 
uh, formed a very close relationship with them, and several of them used to go to Ram. The Ram Chandra Dutta, after Thakur passed away, he was a little bit of a guru himself, maybe even had disciples, uh, and many would go to him. And uh, M said to this Kali Krishna and his friends, it's wonderful that you're going to him. He's a great disciple, that you'll hear everything about Sri Ramakrishna. But if you really want to know what Thakur was like, you have to go and meet his, his monastic disciples. So he's the one who sent them uh, to meet Swamiji and the others. And that Kali Krishna uh, was the first non-direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna to join the order. He had to go back for a short period, for some months, because his health broke down. And in the meantime, this, uh, Sudhir, Swami Shudhananda, he joined. So he, was, uh, he became the first president after the direct disciples, possibly because formerly he was a little senior. And then this Kali Krishna, Swami Virjananda, he became the second president of the order after the direct disciples. But this is a different Kali Krishna. I don't know who this one is. M arrived with Kali Krishna, who did not know where his friend M was taking him. He had only been told, if you want to see a grog shop, then come with me. You will see a huge jar of wine there. M related this to Sri Ramakrishna, who laughed about it. The master said, the bliss of worship and communion with God is the true wine, the wine of ecstatic love. The goal of human life is to love God. Bhakti is the one essential thing. To know God through jnana and reasoning is extremely difficult. Now, this will be a theme that we'll get throughout the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. It's a theme that we find in the Bhagavad Gita also, that is a path of knowledge is a little bit tough. And it's for people with very special qualifications, with people with a tremendous dispassion and renunciation and not much body consciousness. And Thakur used to say in this Kali Yuga, that we're on no goto pran. The, the whole life is centered in, in the body and food and health and all of that. So the people of this age are not very well suited to the path of knowledge. Uh, even though uh, most of what we get, the teaching of, of Sri Ramakrishna, really are, are full of, of the wisdom, jnana yoga. But he wanted that to be uh, a, a foundation for this dualistic practice a, a non-dualistic foundation for dualistic practices of, of, of devotion. Then the Master sang, Who is there that can understand what Mother Kali is? Even the six darshanas are powerless to reveal her. This was one of the Ram Prasad songs that Sri Ramakrishna sang very often. Ram Prasad was really a, a role model for Sri Ramakrishna. That Ram Prasad was a great uh, devotee of the Divine Mother, and uh, really, we can say a poet saint. He was from a village or town now called the Hali Shohar. Uh, you can go there. I went one time. And Ram Prasad's house is still there. And very close to the, uh, where he used to go for bath, the bathing god, where he would sing his songs. And that's where uh, the, uh, one of the local Maharajas heard him singing and, and uh, uh, gave him a stipend and helped him out. And where he passed away, I think it was his, uh, when he was 80 years old on the night of the worship of Mother Kali, uh, chest deep in the Ganga, passed away like that. Anyhow, this is one of the songs of Ram Prasad. Thakur used to say, Mother, you revealed yourself to Ram Prasad. Why not to me? So he loved him very much. There's a, uh, this Ke Jani Kali Kamon, Shoro Doroshon O Napai Doroshon. There's a play on words here. Darshan means the vision of God, but darshan is also one of the, the philosophy. There are six darshanas. So he says you can scour through all of the six darshanas, but you won't find the vision. You won't get that direct vision, the darshana, looking through all of the darshanas. So <laughs> a nice play on words in the song. The Master said again, the one goal of life is to cultivate love for God. The love that the milkmaids, the milkmen, and the cowherd boys of Vrindavan felt for Krishna. So this is Sakya Bhava and Madhur Bhava. When Krishna went away to Mathura, the cowherds roamed about weeping bitterly because of their separation from him. Saying this, the master sang with his eyes turned upward. Just now I saw a youthful cowherd with a young calf in his arms. There he stood 
by one hand holding the branch of a young tree. Where are you, brother Kanai? Kanai is the name of Krishna. But Kanai scarcely could he utter. Ka was as much as he could say. He cried, Where are you, brother? And his eyes were filled with tears. Oh, when M heard this song of the masters, laden with love, his eyes were moist with tears. So, very fortunate that we've reached the end of that day, just when we're ready to stop. So the next uh, meeting that M will have with Sri Ramakrishna will be the first where he gives the actual date. It will be April 2nd. And, you know, this is a, a great theme that... Uh, uh, this the path of knowledge, Sri Ramakrishna used to say, can get to the outer gates of the palace, but devotion will get us to the inner gate. Now, that doesn't mean that we can't have God-realization through the path of knowledge, but this uh, uh, path of devotion allows us to realize God in all aspects, with, with the power, divine power, with the shakti, with uh, all of the, the uh, manifestations and everything. Uh, but we, we shouldn't think that uh, one is superior to the other. Thakur always said that it's a question of individual taste and individual uh, powers of, of digestion. So uh, we will stop here. I will close with the chant. Om Niranjanam Nityam Anantarupam Bhaktanukam Bhathurda Vikraham Ishavataram Parameshya Medyam Tam Ramakrishnam Shirasa Namamaha we bow our heads before Sri Ramakrishna, Niranjanam, who is perfectly pure, eternal, the essence of bliss, whose bhaktanurupam uh, whose heart melts with love and compassion for the devotees, uh, who is the divine incarnation himself. To that uh, worship the adorable Sri Ramakrishna, we bow down. So I thank all of you and uh, Look forward to meeting you again in the next class. Thank you very much.